Russia finds itself entangled in dual conflicts. The visible military engagement in Ukraine that has dominated headlines, and a financial battle that has largely been overlooked. Despite the lack of flashy coverage, the Western world's attempt to crush the ruble is pivotal to the conflict's resolution, just as critical as the physical confrontations on the battleground. As we pivot to the current state of affairs, Ukraine's 2023 offensive, dubbed lackluster by some, inches towards what Valery Zaluzny has termed a deadlock. Amidst this, a curious development has stirred the economic scene on September 21, 2023. The Russian Ministry of Energy took an unexpected step. This move, while subtly covered by major outlets, largely slipped under the public's radar due to the dense fog of macroeconomic implications, a topic that, let's be honest, can induce sleep faster than a lullaby, myself not exempted. Yet, this signals a looming economic tempest Russia faces, with ramifications far-reaching into the conflict's future. So, we are here to dissect the intricacies of the oil embargo, the ruble's fragility, Russia's efforts to boost its currency, and the peculiar way it reports inflation figures, making alarming rates seem tolerable. We'll also explore the motivation behind skewing inflation data, Russia's strategies to soften the real impact of inflation, and ultimately, the strategic depth of the oil export ban. The embargo particularly stung Brazil, Turkey, India, China, and Saudi Arabia, nations that had filled the void in Russia's oil supply chain amidst Western sanctions. You might wonder why Saudi Arabia, the world's top oil exporter, would import Russian oil. Here lies the intrigue of economic sanctions and the lucrative game of arbitrage. Saudi Arabia, while a massive exporter, uses some oil domestically to appease its populace. However, with Russian Ural's oil significantly cheaper than Brent crude, Saudi Arabia finds it economically savvy to import from Russia for domestic use, then export its own oil at a premium, often to Singapore's advantage, thus boosting its revenue. The West aware of such strategies tolerates them provided they don't financially bolster Russia. The Kremlin's decision to halt exports to such strategic partners is baffling at first glance. This move traces back to the onset of hostilities, with Russia amassing a Fortress Russia war chest of $643 billion over eight years. Moscow's strategy hinged on this fund and continuous oil revenues to finance the war without depleting its reserves. However, with the West blocking access to nearly half of this fund and Russia pausing oil exports in September, the motives seem more nuanced than mere coercion. At the heart of this decision was Russia's imperative need for fuel, especially highlighted during the crucial autumn harvest. Russia, serving as a global agricultural powerhouse, found itself in a predicament requiring the conservation of fuel for domestic agricultural needs, thus explaining the export ban's underlying rationale. Before the conflict erupted, Russia was a global agricultural powerhouse responsible for 14.4% of the world's wheat exports, and standing as the third largest wheat producer, trailing only behind China and India. Unlike its populous counterparts, Russia's substantial wheat output, amounting to 76.1 million metric tons, heavily relied on diesel-powered machinery, especially during the critical harvest season. Failure to gather the crops in time meant risking the entire yield to the harsh onset of winter, Moreover, an unspoken agreement exists between the Kremlin and the Russian populace under Putin's regime, allowing citizens to live their lives without meddling in politics, provided the government refrains from foreign adventures impacting daily life. The initial framing of the invasion as a special military operation and the subsequent limited mobilization highlighted this delicate balance, which has been increasingly difficult to maintain, particularly with the September 2022 mobilization. Amidst this backdrop, Russians faced an unexpected hardship, soaring fuel prices. At first glance, the situation seems paradoxical. European sanctions halted Russian oil exports to the West, potentially leading to a surplus within Russia itself. Logic would suggest that absent international demand, Russians could enjoy an abundance of cheap fuel. 
Yet, the anticipated flood of affordable oil didn't materialize, largely due to rampant inflation and a weakening ruble. In the war's initial year, the inflation rates reported by Russia's central bank painted a grim picture, highlighting the economic strain felt by its citizens. The onset of inflation was swift following the conflict's start, necessitating a broader view of currency. Essentially, money represents the total goods and services a country offers, lacking intrinsic value unless, in dire scenarios, it's used as kindling or wallpaper. A reference to Germany's hyperinflation period, its value is derived from the collective belief that it can be exchanged for valuable goods or services. The invasion triggered extensive Western sanctions, affecting not just the military, but also Russia's civilian economy. Supply chains for domestically produced goods reliant on Western components were disrupted, leading to shortages. With the same amount of rubles chasing fewer goods, prices inevitably rose, leading to inflation. This situation was exacerbated when Russians, fearing a devaluation of the ruble, withdrew their savings en masse, either to convert them into stable currencies or to buy durable goods before prices escalated further. This led to a decline in the ruble's value and intensified the supply-demand imbalance. In response to these challenges, the Central Bank of Russia took decisive action by dramatically raising interest rates from 9.5% to 20%. This move aimed to encourage Russians to keep their funds in banks and to signal to the market that steps were being taken to stabilize the economy. The hike in interest rates effectively mitigated the immediate threat of bank runs by discouraging mass withdrawals, driven by the fear of being the last to retrieve funds from an empty bank. Additionally, by withdrawing money from circulation, it helped curb inflation and discouraged the use of credit for purchases due to the prohibitively high interest rates. This approach is a staple in monetary policy, mirroring actions taken by the Federal Reserve in the United States during its 2022 to 2023 inflation bout, which saw interest rates adjusted to manage inflation, peaking at 5.5% in November 2023. Russia, facing a more acute challenge, escalated its rates to 20% in April 2022, a level that historically matches the U.S. peak in 1980. However, this strategy introduces a dilemma. High interest rates mean more money saved in banks, but if goods remain scarce, the issue of too much money chasing too few goods resurfaces, fueling inflation. To mitigate this, increased production is essential, yet high borrowing costs can deter investment in production, potentially hindering long-term economic growth. While the U.S. managed to navigate this challenge, Russia faces unique obstacles in boosting production. The situation in Russia is compounded by three major challenges to boosting production. First, the lack of access to essential input goods stifles the ability to produce, although it has prompted efforts towards import substitution. However, transitioning to domestic production is a slow process. Second, the conscription policy has led to a brain drain with potential entrepreneurs fleeing the country to avoid mobilization. Lastly, the military-industrial complex consumes a significant portion of the country's resources, diverting materials and labor from civilian manufacturing, leading to scarcity and inevitably inflation. And if we go to Russia's official inflation rates in the standard way that they are reported, we see something interesting. It appears as though that has not happened at all as of late. Surprisingly, the inflation figures reported are lower than those before the conflict and are quite favorable for a developing country, even under the stress of war. This has understandably led to skepticism, with suspicions that the Kremlin instructed the reporting of subdued inflation rates around February 2023. The shift from inflation rates of 11.8% and 11% at the beginning of the year to 3.5% in March and 2.3% in April followed by a gradual increase, has raised eyebrows. However, the nuances of calculating and interpreting inflation add layers of complexity to these figures. Inflation data, typically annualized and compared month over month across years, reveal nuances in economic fluctuations. For instance, a 3.5% inflation rate in March doesn't imply a monthly change, but projects what the annual increase would be if the trend persisted, 
translating to a modest monthly increase of about 0.29%. Such reporting nuances, while standard, can obscure the impact of unforeseen events like an invasion. The comparison of March 2023 to March 2022, for instance, highlights that prices have maintained the significant leap experienced at the conflict's onset but have stabilized somewhat thereafter. The detailed look at monthly inflation rates reveals that the majority of inflation occurred in the initial three months of the conflict, with the total inflation for 2022 reaching 11.9%. This rate, while high in isolation, is comparable to or even better than other challenging periods in Russia's recent history such as the sanctions following the annexation of Crimea in 2014 and the oil market struggles in 2015. This performance suggests that, should Russia derive any lasting benefit from this conflict, it may well be the result of its economic rather than military leadership's efforts to stabilize the economy. However, this perspective hinges on the accuracy of the reported inflation figures. Contrary to the constantly monitored official interest rates, the true dynamics of inflation are more easily obscured, making personal assessments of price increases challenging without detailed analysis. This complexity allows Russia to potentially misrepresent its inflation figures for several strategic reasons. International Perception By presenting a stable economic front, Russia aims to convey resilience against Western sanctions, suggesting such measures are ineffective. Domestic Stability Controlling media narratives to report low inflation helps maintain the illusion of wartime prosperity, discouraging public dissent and potential unrest. The message is clear. If you're experiencing price hikes, you're an outlier, and opposition could lead to dire consequences. Wage Price Spiral Avoidance Economically, if the public perceives inflation is on the rise, they'll demand higher wages to preserve purchasing power further fueling inflation in a vicious cycle known as the wage price spiral, a scenario the central bank is keen to prevent. The Kremlin's measures to combat inflation underscore the complexities of Russia's political and economic landscape. President Putin's acknowledgement of inflation hindering business investment, despite a seemingly manageable year-over-year -year rate of 5.1%, and predictions of a 5.55% total inflation for 2023 highlights the challenges faced by Russian enterprises. This concern is amplified against the backdrop of historical inflation rates and the adjustments made by the central bank, such as the significant interest rate hikes to 13% and then to 15% in attempts to curb rising inflation, which nevertheless continued to escalate. The focus then shifts to the public and the broader economic implications particularly the strategies employed by the central bank and Kremlin to stabilize the ruble. Measures including capital controls, restrictions on foreign currency transactions for domestic lenders, and mandatory conversion of a significant portion of foreign currency earnings into rubles were initially successful in maintaining the ruble's superficial strength. Yet, as the conflict prolonged, these short-term solutions morphed into long-term issues leading to a gradual devaluation of the ruble against the dollar. Initially, 100 rubles could buy $1.30, but this value dropped to 70 cents early in the war, only to inexplicably rise to $1.80 by the end of June 2022. Yet, this apparent strength belied a deeper reluctance to hold rubles, leading to a gradual decline in value. By October 2023, the ruble had depreciated to $1.01, .01, marking a significant loss from its pre-war value, though it saw a slight recovery to $1.09 by November. This backdrop sets the stage for revisiting the implications of the oil export ban and its impact on businesses dealing in commodities. Serving local customers has its advantages, such as avoiding the complexities and costs associated with international shipping. Though in Russia's vast landscape, even domestic transport can be extensive. However, the attractiveness of local markets diminishes when payments are made in a currency beleaguered by inflation. The global demand for Russian commodities, payable in stronger foreign currencies, presents a lucrative alternative, despite the need to sell at below market rates due to geopolitical tensions.
The dilemma then becomes whether to face domestic fuel price surges or shortages as the equilibrium shifts. Traditionally, Russia has offset these challenges through damper payments to oil companies, encouraging them to prioritize the domestic market. But the financial strains of war have led to cuts in these subsidies, intensifying the predicament for the Kremlin, which is acutely aware of the public sensitivity to certain issues, such as pension reforms and fuel price hikes, both of which have previously incited significant public dissent. Ironically, while Russia once leveraged fuel prices as a geopolitical tool, it now faces internal challenges mirrored by those it sought to impose on others. The response, an export ban aimed to mitigate shortages and stabilize prices domestically, thereby also addressing inflation. However, this approach represents a deviation from economic efficiency, essentially acting as a redistribution of wealth from oil companies to the general populace, rather than a strategic maneuver to enhance the nation's economic standing. Considering the broader context, discussions on Putin's domestic popularity and tenure often polarize into two extreme views, one arguing he has no support and another believing his position is unassailable. However, reality suggests a middle ground. Prior to the conflict, public enthusiasm for Putin seemed genuine. Yet there's a limit to how much policy change the public will tolerate without backlash, as evidenced by pension reform protests and the departure of many men following the mobilization order in September 2022. The implementation of the oil export ban can be seen as an acknowledgement by the Kremlin of the need to maintain domestic support to prevent political instability that could threaten Putin's hold on power. This maneuver indirectly benefited Ukraine by reducing financial resources available for the Russian war effort. Ukraine's strategy in late 2023, assuming Russia would not initiate another mobilization, seems validated by the oil ban. The assumption is that the Russian populace's potential discontent with increased costs for transportation pales in comparison to the outcry another conscription announcement could provoke. The Kremlin's aversion to dealing with domestic dissatisfaction suggests a tactical calculation to avoid exacerbating public unrest. However, the necessity of war financing means such policies are temporary. With the end of the harvest season and the onset of winter, the emphasis shifted back to war funding, prompting Russia to relax the export ban to rejuvenate its military coffers, albeit with measures to soften the financial impact. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe.